Hey, good afternoon. My name is Ben from Rebel Book Club and this afternoon I'm going to be chatting uh, with an author that I've loved uh, reading over the last few years. Over the last few years and following, he's got a really interesting um, career and story. Um, So if you would like to uh, follow along, we're going to be talking with Roman Kazanich shortly. Uh, Roman is uh, about to release his, I believe, his fourth book. Um, he started with a book called Empathy um, and then off the back of it created the Empathy Museum um, and the Empathy Library, which are really interesting projects. He was one of the founding members of the School of Life. Um, he then wrote The Wonder Box, which I don't much know much about. Uh, and then after that, he wrote a book called Carpe, Rede- um, Carpe Diem Regain, which is all about sort of growth mindset and what that what that sort of phrase means in the modern world um, and his new book The Good Ancestor How to Think Long Term in a Short Term World uh, is about to be released and it feels like uh, probably really pressing time as well um, so Roman will be joining us here on Instagram shortly for a conversation so if you've got any questions for a public philosopher for a uh, here's Roman good to see you Roman if you just um, request to join this conversation now I can add you in here we go uh, so Roman, you should have a notification. You just tap in that. Hi everyone, good to see you all. Lots of okay, faces. Hey Roman, how are you doing, Ben? Really good to see you. Your library is bigger than mine. That you win that battle, one nil. Doesn't mean I've read my books. I think I've probably read about ten percent of them now. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, it's, it's exactly, it's what you do with them. So um, really, really glad you could join us this afternoon. Um, and uh, I'm glad that, you know, we've got, we forced you onto Instagram, probably against, against your will, but you never know, it might, it might help sell a few more books and reach a few more people. Well, you're the only person I'm following so far. <laughs> wow, Rebel Book Club, a good, good place <laughs> to start. Um, so it's really good to connect with you. We've never actually spoken, even though I've been, reading your books and following your work and, and school of life. And obviously someone, you know, who wrote donut economics and, and all of that rebel book club for a while. So it's, it's great to finally connect. I think from, uh, for people who are following this um, and do, if you have questions for Roman, do drop them in um, below and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try and answer a few and Roman will answer them. Um, but I'd love to go back to, I guess, in the beginning of your, your career as a writer and an author and how, how did you get into that and what, And what led to the first book and what was that about? Well, I used to be an academic and I decided after some years to run away from that in a way because I didn't feel I was communicating my ideas to a wide enough audience. And by chance, I met a wonderful historian called Theodore Zeldin who wrote a book called Intimate History of Humanity, which I probably got right next to me here. There it is. And this was a path-breaking book in the history of the emotions written in the mid-1990s. And this book influenced me hugely, and it made me think, I want to write a book a bit like this. And it prompted me to write my first uh, main non-fiction book called The Wonder Box, um, which came out in 2011, which is this book here, Curious Histories of How to Live, is the title. And the idea of The Wonder Box is the question of how should we live, that question that so many books try and grapple with. But what I recognized that when I went to the bookshop and looked at all those personal development books and self-help books, they were based either on ideas from philosophy, psychology, or religion. And I thought what was missing was history. What can we actually learn from how people have really lived in the past? How did the ancient Greeks think about love? Or what can we learn from the next ones about death? And so that's what I took on myself to follow. An idea that the uh, you know, dramatist Goethe said, he said, he who cannot draw on 3,000 years is living from hand to mouth. And that was my inspiration to draw like, on the past. Right, let's, go, let's take that challenge on of 3,000 years and put it into something accessible. And did, did the Wonder Box, this is the only book of yours that I think I haven't read, uh, which I'd like to. Did did it conclude with more questions or, or a, a sort of a plan of action of how to how to apply this to your life? Well, it was all about application, but the final chapter, the end of the book, is called Death Style. And the idea there was that when we open the newspapers, there's always a lifestyle section. But 
There's no death style section. How to think about our mortality. And that, of course, is something we are all thinking about now. I mean, yesterday morning, I had a really difficult conversation with my 87-year-old father in Sydney, trying to convey to him the seriousness of COVID-19. He's a guy who lived through the Second World War in Poland and survived and thinks nothing can touch him. And I had to say to him, you know, if you want to see your grandchildren again, my 11-year-old twins, you've got to take this seriously. And, but of course, we're not used to having conversations about death in society, but in a way, what we're going through now is shifting that radically. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, even more relevant now. So that's, that's Wonderbox. If I can pick up on your twins and maybe link to, to empathy, which I read a, a couple of years ago. And I remember this, uh, so I, we just had our, our first daughter. And I remember in the opening of this, you talk about, you use your twins as, as an example of the difference between sympathy and empathy was like the slight difference. Was it age two to three where they were good at, you know, sharing maybe when with one of their toys with the other one when it was when he or she was upset. But once they got to the next level, they were like, oh, he or she would prefer this toy because that's their favorite. And that that kind of like hooked me into this. And it, tell us a bit more about how you got involved with writing this proper book. Yeah, so the topic of empathy really struck me because well, I got into it because I used to be a political scientist. I used to think that the way you change the world is through changing political So I think Roman just dropped out there, but we are going to try and get it back any second. Uh, Roman, if you're watching, uh, just hit request to join. It should give you the other option. Um, someone else requesting to join. We're actually just waiting for Roman to rejoin us because we we're just getting to the meat of it. Um, and I'm sure he'll be back in a second. Um, so we are talking uh, to Roman Kazanich, and this is uh, the book that we were talking about just now. Um, this is Empathy. Here we go. There might be an, uh, another request to join in here. Uh, where is Roman? T -t 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 -t. He's not back yet. Okay. I'm sure he will be in a second. If not, we'll just restart the conversation in a minute. Uh, so this is a book called Empathy. And then he's got a new book out coming out in the next couple of months called The Good Ancestor. Um, and it sounds like Wonderbox, his first book, is something that the really interesting to read in the context of where we're at today. Um, so I'm just going to see if Roman is going to rejoin us. Um, I'm sure he will do uh, if his connection is there. And um, if not, we're just going to start this video again. Here he is. Let's add Roman back in. Probably just got distracted by one of the many books on his shelf behind him. I'm back. Had... Hey, you're back. You're in, you've moved uh, location. I have something went weird with my connection. So now I've gone into my a little room where my children play around in and I'm sitting on the floor, um, but I'm ready to continue. Oh, fantastic. No, no problem at all, Roman. So you were just starting to, we were talking about em the, the book Empathy and, um, and how you came to write that and what came out of that, that journey. Yeah, so I, I got into this topic of empathy because I used to be a political scientist and I started realizing that the way we change the world is not just through from the top down through new laws and institutions, but from the way people treat each other in everyday life and stepping into the shoes of other people, particularly across social divides, people from different cultures or gender or whatever class backgrounds is partly how we knit the world together and create new social bonds. And that's what really drove me to write the book about empathy recognizing that empathy is a profound form of social change that back in the 18th century that empathy was used as part of the campaigns against slavery in the slave trade you know slaves went around the country talking about their stories people heard their voices and that instigated um support uh, for the abolition of the slave trade and and that really drove this book on, on empathy and as you said it sort of starts with my children because empathy is also something that exists in the home we all 
no, it matters, right? Because you can be arguing with your partner, husband, wife, whatever. And sometimes you think, oh God, I wish they could just understand where I'm coming from. I wish they yeah. could see things from my point of view. And certainly during the Corona crisis that we're in, where families are together, there, you know, we've seen spikes of domestic violence. We've seen a, a, a real need for empathic listening in the household, but it's not something you learn at school or uh, it's learn at college or anything like that. So it's something I think we all need to skill up on. Absolutely. And you've, it's spun off brilliantly into classic sort of school of life approaches. How do we apply this? Um, so, so tell us a little bit about the library, the empathy library and the museum that you experimented with. Um, I don't know what stage those projects are at because it sounds like they, those things are needed more than ever. So one of the things I did after writing this book, Empathy, was to set up something called the Empathy Museum, which is an international arts project which travels around the world and gives people an opportunity to experience the life of another person. And this was a big leap for me because I'm a writer and I like sitting in my little room with my books. Um, and I started recognizing, of course, that to get those ideas out into the world, we, I needed to engage with different publics and in different ways. And so one of the exhibits the Empathy Museum has, probably the best known, is called A Mile in My Shoes. And it's a gigantic mm. shoebox which travels around the world. It's been on the South Bank. It's been in New York. It's been in Brazil and Siberia. And you walk inside. It looks like a giant shoebox. You walk inside and you, it's the world's first empathy shoe shop. You're literally fitted with the shoes of another person. Maybe a guy who's been in prison for 14 years or a Syrian refugee or a Brazilian sex worker. And you can literally walk in there a mile in their shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their life in their own words. It's very intimate. It's very powerful. It's run by proper artists, not by me. It's led by a director, great artist called Claire Patey. Um, but for me, it was a real lesson that when you publish a book, it's not enough. You know, that if possible, no, one wants I, to try and reach beyond it. And it sounds, it sounds like from the, what, what's so important in that particular project is the senses, connecting your senses to someone else's experience. So obviously there's the storytelling and the audio, and then there's the physicality of walking or being in someone else's shoes themselves so how do we i guess how do we i know you've got a six-step guide in this book about doing it but when we're in our confined privileged but quarantined lives right now how do we practice that better how can we be more empathetic it's easy to say it but how do we what what little tips and tricks can we apply do you think yeah i mean the classic way of course of well, what i've always thought of practicing empathy is something that's difficult to practice now, which is to develop your curiosity about strangers, to have chats with people who you wouldn't normally meet, whether it's the quiet librarian who lives across the road or the person who you buy a newspaper off each day. And in some ways that is more difficult now because we're not out on the streets in a way practicing that kind of curiosity, which challenges prejudices and assumptions. But certainly my experience, I don't know about you or other people listening to this, is that during COVID-19, uh, like on my street, hardly anybody ever normally spoke to each other. But now we have this incredibly vibrant WhatsApp group. And there we are meeting people, often online, by having an online baking circle or all sorts of crazy stuff, delivering food to, um, you know, our older people who can't get out. And we are having these encounters with strangers, sometimes talking through doors or across fences from a distance. But it's really enlightening and i think it's it's a real opening um and that this is one of these things about coronavirus how do we try and take advantage of the crisis mm, yeah so a shared enemy like fast tracks empathy uh, which is which is i guess is what's needed so from that which i could talk to you lots more about but i'm going to move on so I, I, there's more there's more work since then um so carpe diem regained um so this is an, a great image on the front of this book of the bull and the ballerina. So tell us how this project came about and, uh, and what, you, what the essence of the Carpe Diem Regained is. Yeah, so that book is about the art of seizing the day and trying to challenge the way that seizing the day has been captured by modern consumer culture, just, uh, you, know, you know, seizing the day sort of, ju just sort of, you know, that just do it, that Nike kind of idea, just do it's really become just buy it. Um, or just do it's become just watch it. And it was a call to challenge that consumer culture 
And I think, you know, a lot of the books in Rebel Book Club are, are trying to erode that kind of um, obsession of materialism. But it was also a call to say, look, let's not think about seizing the day as just being about an individual, about my life and me going bungee jumping or climbing Everest. Let's think about the collective seizing of the day, not carpe diem, but carpamos diem. Let's seize the day together. Because history changes when we rise up and act collectively. That's how the Berlin Wall came down. And in some ways, you know, if I was going to build a, a monument to seizing the day, a kind of a, a temple, over the front of it, it would have these words, act first, think later. And I think that's something that can inspire us on an individual level, but we're also seeing it today in politics. I mean, look what governments are doing. Suddenly, the British government basically nationalizes private health care and takes yeah. over all of the hospitals. Now, yeah. in normal circumstances, even if anyone proposed that, if, every, if any politician listened to it, it would be years of committees and it would never happen in the end. But suddenly, act first, think later, let's just do it because it's an emergency. And somehow it gets done. And I think that philosophy of that first think later is vital when we're thinking of the longer term challenges raised by the coronavirus. In other words, getting us to think about other, other emergencies that may be on the horizon, whether it's the threat of genetically engineered pandemics or lethal autonomous weapons and AI, and of course, the climate crisis and, you know, the, you know, challenging our carbon obsessions that there's a lot of just do it possibilities that governments could be doing and us as individuals too. It's almost like your, your writing trilogy so far has, uh, is being brought into sharp focus because of what the events of the last six weeks in the world. And like, this is, we're facing mortality. We're facing uh, how to like be more compassionate at scale. And now we're facing about like, we need to act at speed and like be super focused. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's great that it's so relevant. Um, and that brings us to The Good Ancestor. So uh, this is being published um, in the next couple of months, right? And tell us, uh, tell us about The Good Ancestor, why you wrote it and what it's about. Yeah, there's a little mock-up of it, The Good Ancestor, how to think long-term <laughs> in a short-term world. Um, there's a question at the heart of this book, which is one that was raised by the great immunologist Jonas Salk. He was the guy who discovered the polio vaccine in 1955. He said, but the only question that really matters today is, are we being good ancestors? In other words, how are we going to be remembered by future generations? Did we steward the planet well in the face of the great challenges of our age? Whether those challenges were the threat of nuclear war, the long-term challenges, um, the threat of you know, pandemics he was interested in, of course, and you know, the threat, threats of new technologies as well. He believed that we needed to, if we're going to tackle these things, we needed to expand our time horizon. So instead of thinking on a scale of seconds, minutes, and hours, we needed to expand to a scale of decades, centuries, and millennia. And that's what this new book, The Good Ancestor, is all about. It's saying we need to escape the tyranny of the now. And of course, we realize that long-term vision, that long-term cathedral thinking really matters. Look at those countries that have responded effectively to coronavirus, South Korea, Taiwan. These were the ones that were planning possible pandemics. Compare it with the United States, which in 2018, the National Security Council abolished their pandemic response unit. Now, that was not long-term thinking, and we can see the results of that. So the good answer is all about taking that long, long view and it's a challenging thing to do because we, you know, politicians can't see beyond the next elections, businesses beyond the quarterly report. We want to click the buy now button. Um, but if we don't take that longer view and start looking beyond our own lifetimes, we are going to be jeopardizing the lives of the billions upon billions of people who will inhabit the future. And those future generations, they have no stake in the political system. They're not here. They can't throw themselves in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or block an Alabama bridge like a civil rights protester or glow, go on a salt march like, you know, Mahatma Gandhi against colonial oppressors. And, you know, we, we colonize the future. We treat it as a dumping ground for ecological degradation, technological risk, nuclear waste, public debt, 
And I think we need to decolonize the future. And my hope is that this moment of history will be one where we kind of reorient our institutions and not let them get captured by authoritarianism, but use it to revive democracy for these long-term goals. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, I, I want to read it now. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great introduction to the topic. And the, the obvious question is how, right? So is it through the, the, obviously you've got this forced global event happening, which may accelerate so many of those things, but uh, I was just thinking back as you were talking to the times where I felt most connected to ancestry or ancestors and um, as, a, as a sort of not just a metaphor, but as a real thing. And I had the privilege of living in, a, in Fiji in the South Pacific for a few years on an island. And in their culture, as, as you may know, is that the, the ancestors are almost brought into everyday conversations. Every time you sit down for not for a, a prayer, but a moment of reflection before a meal or thank gratitude around their carver bowl and so on, there's a they they have a little saying which is all around we're letting you know the people who formerly lived here that we're about to have this meal or about to marry these people or about to bury this person. And it was this constant invoking of like respect, respect because they because of the spiritual beliefs that they're still there. They're still very much in the room, even though you can't see them. And it was so powerful because it did make you think more about your actions every day because you're like, there's a little bit of there's people looking over my shoulder who put a lot of time and energy into this place. Don't screw it up. And so you become a better citizen or, or so on. Is that the sort of thing that do you think is going to we need to do more of? And if so, how? How do we recognize the like the importance of ancestry in our in our world? I think you're spot on to focus on ancestry, particularly Pacific cultures. I mean, if you go, you know, in New Zealand, uh, Maori culture, there is this concept mm -hmm. called Faka Papa, spelt with a WH at the beginning. You can pronounce Faka Papa. And it's this idea of that we're all in a long chain of existence stretching into the past and into the future. Mm -hmm. And the light happens to be shining on this short moment now. And what we need to do is shine the light more brightly. So as you say, when we're sitting here in a room, we feel the living and the dead and the unborn all here with us, that sense mm -hmm. of intergenerationality. But of course, it's very difficult to feel in a culture, particularly Western culture, where we're so cut off from our ancestors of course, some people love reading, you know, family history magazines, but most of us are a bit like, you know, um, the, the children in, in Philip Pullman's Dark Materials, where they're, they're severed from their demons, from their souls, from their animal spirits. We're severed from our ancestors. So how do we reconnect with that? And ideas, for example, like, you know, in many Native American um, communities, there's this idea of seventh generation thinking, that we should be making our decisions based on thinking seven generations ahead. And I think one way to do it, and it's tough, is to, in a way, conduct thought experiments where you might, for example, just imagine to yourself someone from a younger generation than you that you care yeah. about, a nephew or niece or godchild or one of your own kids, and then kind of just close your eyes and imagine them 30 years in the future and what their life will be like and what's, going, or what's happening in the world around them. And then imagine them on their 90th birthday surrounded by their family and friends. And I've done this thought experiment where you imagine this young person on their 90th birthday, surrounded by family and friends in their, their local community, and they stand up about to give a 90th birthday speech. And then over on the mantelpiece, they suddenly see a photograph of you, their distant relative, and decide to tell the room about the legacy that you left them. What they learn from you about life. And as a thought experiment, you can then write down, well, what did they say in their memorial speech about you, this ancestor from the past? Wow. And I think that kind of thing can really touch you. It can be very challenging because especially if you have a dark vision of the future, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing, but it's one of those ways to try and make a visceral empathic connection with future generations. Because that 90 year old and their children could live well into the 22nd century that is not science fiction that is an intimate family fact. no and we and we thought we thought we were in you know the climate crisis and the speed of that accelerating was was uh, a tough enough challenge until you know a few weeks ago um that's so powerful roman and it i we've done this exercise 
uh, not Rebel Book Club, but in, in sort of entrepreneur groups and career change communities I've been part of where you write a postcard from your future to yourself from the future. But usually it's six months or 12 months. So to try and put, you know, put yourself into those shoes of, oh, this is where I want to be and it feels good. Now, how do I work back from it? And that and that's powerful. But to do it, you know, as a 90 year old looking back on some, you know, another 90 year old looking back on your own life, what would they, that's, that's intense. That's a real, uh, that's a real powerful thing to do. I, um, oh, so many things to explore around this. I think one of the things talking to uh, friends and communities like Rebel Book Club that people are just struggling with right now, um, where I think your work and, and leadership can help so much is how to deal with this in the day to day. So we're, we're stressed uh, as a society around health, obviously, and finance. Uh, and uncertainty so in terms of applying these big these big ideas about thinking long term or empathizing at scale or like seizing the day collectively what's when you get stuck when you feel like oh i'm, I'm annoyed with my family or i can't see how we're going to change the political structure how do you what do you do to get yourself out of those sort of funks or, or blockages it's that's a really great question it's really difficult i think partly I think about how is it that a society changes? And I really believe, and I've learned this over the years, that it does change when people start treating each other differently at the grassroots. That if we're going to reinvent society, it comes out of exactly what is happening now. The neighborhood groups, those WhatsApp groups, and all those kinds of things. And this is genuine foundation for social and political transformation. It may not feel like it now, but let me give you an example. In Japan, there is an incredible political movement for long-term political thinking called Future Design. And what they do is they bring together citizens from a local community or town, and they split them into two groups. The first group are told to make plans for their city based on them, you know, for their, their, their health service or environmental uh, provision, and they're told they're citizens from the present. The second group are giving these beautiful ceremonial kimonos to wear and told that they are citizens from 2060 and told, and they're then instructed to make plans for their city, imagining they are from a future generation, 40 years in the future. It turns out that the group from 2060 make much more radical plans when it comes to health and environment and education. Now that's grassroots democracy growing in Japan. And I think that the community groups that are, mutual aid groups that are exploding around Britain at the moment um, are only a few small steps away from those kinds of models. That's the citizen assembly model. And there's huge impetus for this. We've seen it in Ireland. We've seen it in Spain. Um, mm. So there is, you know, the beginning of something deeply democratic going on just by the way that we're treating our neighbors, you know, yeah. Um, and I think that's something to hope for. But of course, the other side of the flip side of that is the dark stuff that we've seen all these governments, you know, really, there's going to be a problem of what I think of as authoritarian residue, that governments have taken emergency powers, they won't want to give them back, whether it's in Hungary or Israel, or six countries have just given up being implementing the European Declaration of Human Rights. Um, but I think in our own lives, we can grasp onto community and grasp onto one other idea. I was thinking about this this morning. I wrote this other book <laughs> called um, How to Find Fulfilling Work. It was part of the School of Life oh, series. Yes. And in yeah, that, of course. Yeah. Uh, in fact, got, uh, there it is there. Um, and in that book is the idea of striving not to be a high achiever, but a wide achiever, um, you know, like a Renaissance generalist. And one of the things I found, I don't know about you, Ben, but at this time, stuck inside, I'm having to be a wide achiever. One moment I'm a writer sitting in my study, suddenly I'm a school teacher teaching my kids and cooking many, many more meals, cleaning houses, doing this, helping neighbors, all sorts of things. And I kind of get a kick out of that idea that I'm learning new skills, I'm floundering away at being a bad school teacher, but trying. And I think these are one of these things where when we feel we're learning, we can sort of center ourselves. And I think that's yeah. a good thing. It doesn't help with the devastation that COVID-19 is creating across the world in a direct way, but it's one of the ways that we get through it because we are creative creatures, learning creatures, and that is a, a fount of well-being. Yeah, and, and the discomfort often leads to the...
lost your connection. That, no, no, it's still here. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with all of that, Roman. And I, I th sort of, um, sort of leaving thought on all of this to get from you would be, uh, in terms of being a good ancestor beyond the street, um, which, where can we put our energies? Um, what are, the, are there any other projects? I know you're closely related to a project called the Donut, Donut Economics, which we read at Rebel Book Club, yeah. which we're yeah. huge fans of. Um, in fact, so much so that we've got a stack of them over there to send to some of our uh, most loyal and engaged members, along with a couple of our other favorite books. Yeah, um, what... I'm familiar with, it was written by my partner, Kate, Kate Rayworth. Um, I think in terms of what we can do, there are some great initiatives you can support. So for example, Wales has a Future Generations Commissioner, which is a public position that's designed to help scrutinize legislation and, and look at its long-term impacts. And there is a campaign led by the Big Issue founder, John Bird, to create a Future Generations Commissioner for the whole UK. And you can go to a website called Today for Tomorrow and support that campaign so that we have public institutions that are looking at things like potential pandemics coming our way and technological risks on the horizon and ecological risks on the horizon. That's a practical thing. And then abroad, you can support campaigns. For example, in the US, there's a great campaign called Our Children's Trust, which is campaigning to secure legal rights for future generations. In other words, giving rights to unborn people. It's amazing. And they're trying to, they're taking the US government to court for violating the rights of future generations to a clean climate and a healthy atmosphere. So it's all about this US subsidies of the fossil fuel industry. So there's amazing long-term um, movements to support as well as working in your local communities to power them up to become the basis for a, a revolution of citizen assemblies once we somehow find our way through this. That's, that's a great a great uh great tips at the end i think that combination of like you know it's almost what we can practically do those of us who are fortunate to have time to be online is like support the local community and then when you're online support these projects that are trying to make things better in the longer term so thanks for sharing all that roman uh lots of food for thought we've recorded this video so we'll share it with our members and we finally got you on instagram so hopefully that might not be a distraction but help uh, share your wisdom and your work uh, to, a, to a new and further audience. But um, yeah, good luck with the teaching and the domesticities and, uh, and the launch of The Good Ancestor. And we hopefully will be reading that Rebel Book Club sometimes in the next, next year or two. Thanks so much for the conversation, Ben. Really enjoyed it and very thought-provoking. See you. Pleasure. Hi to Kate. Take care.